Hi guys, welcome back. I've got a bit more doom and gloom and then some positive news as well from the world of shooting legislation. Those of you that shoot will be aware that for a long time now there's been a debate raging uh, from the powers that be regarding lead. Uh, lead as used in bullets, you know, for rifles, pistols, etc. And then also for use in air guns and also used in shot for shotgun cartridges, of course. So part of this is due to environmental damage. You know, there's the, a crowd of people that believe that this lead is polluting the environment in a variety of different ways. It's also, they believe, making its way into the food chain. So people that are shooting pigeons or pheasant or whatever, and then those things are being eaten. They've got lead shot in. There's a possibility, you know, that that's finding its way into humans and obviously the, there's a concern about that. Then on top of all that, you know, that these projectiles, these bullets are obviously uh, hitting the environment and staying in the environment. You know, if it passes through an animal that's been shot and it finds its way into a tree or into the an earth bank or something like that, obviously it's going to fragment apart and there's going to be lead spillage and there's concern that that will be picked up by animals or, you know, just uh, affect the environment in a negative way. And I'm not saying whether it does or it doesn't. I really don't know enough about that kind of thing to comment. I have read quite a bit of stuff that suggests actually there's not really much harm to the environment through that. Um, and I've read a few bits that argue the other way as well. But, you know, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm not going to debate the the rights and wrongs of that. There's also a concern that lead in ammunition is harmful to the shooter um, because every time you shoot something, you know, let's say you're shooting a an FMJ type projectile, then there's going to be lead particulate that comes out of the back of that. So every time the, the breech of that firearm gets open, there's going to be some gases that come out and they've got really fine lead particles in that you're going to breathe in i mean primers have lead in as well a lot of them some are lead free now but there's another source of lead for you as well and obviously if you're shooting on a range and those projectiles are hitting a backstop and all gathering there you've then got this kind of mass of lead uh, on the shooting range you're in that's going to be a, a hazard to humans and then of course you've got the manufacturer of these projectiles to begin with that because you know the community the shooting community wants to use lead-based products that someone has to manufacture them so you're looking then at adding lead into the workplace and people being exposed to it in quite high quantities uh, all the ppe and stuff that goes along with that but you know the generalized health and safety sort of theory is that wherever possible you must minimize exposure to sort of toxic uh, elements and compounds and one of the first ways you would do that is to not have it in the workplace at all if it could be swapped out for something that was less toxic. So this all started with the uh, REACH compliance, which was a European thing. Now, when we got out of Europe, everyone sort of cheered a little bit in the shooting community because many people assumed that we would just drop the REACH compliance. There was a few propellants that got banned under REACH. Uh, some of the American propellants we can't get anymore because they contain substances that fall foul of this REACH compliance measure. And basically that was where propellants were found to have toxic substances in. I mean, all, none, no propellants are particularly safe for human health. Uh, they've all got some pretty horrible stuff in if you were to eat it or breathe it in all the time. Uh, but some of these propellants had stuff that they found could be swapped out for safer chemicals. So that was why those things got banned under reach. The same thing was happening with lead throughout Europe. You know, lead was falling foul, foul of this reach compliance as well. So we didn't bow out. Unfortunately, the UK then started up a sort of UK reach situation uh, through HSE, etc., the um you know the health and safety guys that come around and make us all safer i'll say that in inverted commas because often some of the stuff they do is slightly questionable and seems to be quite money orientated but again a subject for another video but uh, they sort of seized upon this with this uk reach compliance and they've been pushing towards a lead ban in shooting this went to a consultation 
So people replied to that consultation. We all had the opportunity to do that. And that then took about six months for the HSE and various different people to kind of read through all these replies and then come up with some sort of document of recommendations uh, for what they were going to do moving forward. Now, those in the rifle community have been quite well aware of this for some time. Monolithic projectiles made of copper, brass are becoming more and more popular, uh, probably because of the stuff that's gone on in Europe. You know, we're starting now to take on board some of that stuff. Uh, certainly some places that you would shoot live quarry. I think the Forestry Commission, for example, has already banned lead. Uh, I know I've spoken to a lot of their guys that don't use lead-based projectiles anymore. They're using monolithics. It is becoming slowly more feasible for people that are shooting centerfire rifles. One of the biggest uh, problems that I know the community were very concerned about was the air gun situation because unlike rifles which have access to these copper and brass monolithic projectiles and shotguns which have access to bismuth and steel and we'll get into that in a minute because i know people are going to say well they're not great options but we'll, we'll talk about that slightly uh, air guns really didn't have any other great options and i think it's part of the reason why they've kind of had a a little bit of a bonus here so i'll go through the recommendations from HSE that's just come out in late October and we'll just talk about uh, each part of the recommendation and how it looks to affect our sport. Um, there have been some people that are kind of calling this you know like an attack on shooting um, you know some kind of under the counter sort of ban on people shooting. I really don't think it's that. The reach stuff goes through many many different industries. There's all kinds of uh, industries and things that have been affected by reach it isn't just lead in shooting it's all kinds of stuff so wherever you are whatever you're doing there will be something that you use that has been affected by this reach compliance and it's just the fact that the UK have chosen to carry on doing this reach compliant stuff which is affecting the shooting community. It's not some sort of weird conspiracy to try and remove guns off people. There are certainly other things that people are doing to try and remove guns off people, but I don't believe this is one of them. So I put a link uh, to this document below and I'll just let you know the name of it. It's from HSE and it's Agency Opinion on the Annex 15 Dossier proposing restrictions on lead in ammunition date 11th of october 2023 from uk reach agency and they discuss at the beginning like basically what we've just said the hazards of lead uh, the main exposure pathways relevant to lead ammunition used for live quarry shooting and outdoor target shooting uh, the socio-economic assessment and analysis all those kind of things so we'll skip those bits because we kind of know what they've been up to there then it does mention and something that i should add that people that are you know water fowlers that are shooting over water sources in the uk are already under a lead ban so those guys for quite a few years now have been shooting with bismuth or maybe steel and they cannot use lead anymore over those waterways and that's been going on for quite a while they're kind of a niche community and it was a bit of a shame that the rest of the shooting community kind of said, oh, well, it's not our problem, you know, we're not waterfowlers and everyone kind of ducked their heads down a bit and buried their heads in the sand and didn't really support those guys. And I know that led to a, a little bit of upset within their community. They kind of felt that, uh, that maybe the, the shooting community as a whole should have pulled together a little bit better. And I think we can probably say that about every time something like this happens that you know if it's something that's going to negatively affect a part of the shooting community it's quite common that the rest of the parts of the shooting communities just sort of turn the other way and pretend nothing's happening because there's almost an attitude of well you know if I sort of keep quiet over in this corner no one's going to do anything to me because I'm a good boy and I'll, I'll leave those guys to kind of carry the can and, and they can get in trouble and uh you know, that's a, a pretty poor attitude. You know, we should all be supporting one another no matter what discipline we shoot. So the important part, the proposed restrictions. So we start off with live quarry shooting. So live quarry shooting with shot, i.e. with shotguns, restriction on the placing on the market and use. 
So that is quite a, a serious situation that any shotgun ammunition that contains more than 1% lead, so it stipulates that at the beginning of this report as well, um, that it could have below 1% lead in it and it wouldn't be subject to any restriction. But of course, lead shot's going to have way more than 1% lead in it. It's going to, it's lead shot, so it's got a lot of percent lead in it. In effect, that will ban it from the marketplace. And don't get too panicked, people. I know people like to freak out on, on, my, on these videos and kind of go, oh my God, he's saying that it's going to get banned. Well, this hasn't come into force yet. This is like the recommendations they're making. It's entirely likely it will come into force, but that won't be for some time. So we'll, we'll address that in a minute as well. Live quarry shooting with bullets. So this would be people, you know, doing uh, deer stalking, etc. No recommendation in this document, waiting further information from the public consultation. So as yet, they've got no recommendation. And some of the reason for that is because it's going to be difficult for these guys to navigate the people that are culling animals in a ethical and responsible manner using ammunition that's the best choice for the job, while also negating things like ricochet hazard, making sure, you know, the animal's dispatched properly with something that readily expands and, and does the job as it should. And that isn't an easy sort of argument to have. It's going to take quite a lot of uh, inputs from scientists, ballisticians, uh, and people that actually do that for a living, probably with the uh, Forestry Commission, etc., uh, to have some further consultation on that, because that's a difficult one to answer. And then live quarry shooting with air gun ammunition, no action. So great news for people that are vermin shooters with air guns. You know, if you're a pest controller and you're using air guns to take out rats, pigeons, all that kind of thing, there's going to be no change in the law. You're not going to be restricted whatsoever. Outdoor target shooting. So outdoor target shooting with shot. So this would be things like clay shooting, and it might extend even to things like practical shooting, for example. Restriction on the placing on the market and use, with a derogation for individual athletes as identified by appropriate sporting body. So again, another really serious one. This basically looks to ban all shotgun ammunition that utilizes lead shot in it. And there would be some kind of caveat as yet unknown for certain athletes that would need to use it for whatever discipline they were doing. It doesn't say what kind of athletes, you know, it could be Olympians, for example, or it could be down to people that shoot at uh, club level competitions. It just doesn't say that. But one thing's for sure, if it's banning lead for, or if it's banning lead uh, shot based cartridges in general from being sold, that means that it's going to be very difficult to get hold of them. The companies that produce shotgun cartridges are going to all move over to steel or maybe some other materials like bismuth, ITX or whatever they're going to move over to. And that will mean that any lead-based stuff that they do still produce for this sort of niche of competitive shooters is going to go up substantially in price because the whole reason that 12-gauge cartridges are kind of cheap is because that they can mass produce them and they're all using basically the same materials so they can buy the materials in bulk they can mass produce and automate the process and they can sell those things at quite a good price although they have gone up quite a bit recently but they're still at a pretty reasonable price when you compare them to other types of ammunition or even if you compare them to other uh, gauges for shotgun you know if you try to buy something for uh, any other gauge other than 12 you're probably going to think well that costs a bit of money it's because they're more niche they can't produce as many of them they're not getting that economy of scale that they're getting with the 12 gauge stuff pretty bad news you know that even if you are one of those competitive shooters that's uh, uh, pointed out that, that can get around this piece of legislation I think the cost of your uh, cartridges is going to go up considerably. Outdoor target shooting with bullets. Restriction on the use with a derogation for use at certain sites. So there is going to be a restriction and there's certain places where you will be able to shoot using standard ammunition, uh, i.e. you know, a, a copper jacket lead core. Now, I don't know exactly what they mean by that. I can take a guess. And my guess would mean, having read some 
further stuff in this that they're talking about ranges that have a number of policies in place that deal uh, in a safe manner with the lead contamination. So ranges that de-lead on a regular basis and they keep records of that and they have health and safety procedures in place to make sure people aren't getting on the range and digging around in the sand or that kids can't run on there when it's not in use and kind of dig through the sand and pull things out of it and get covered in lead dust. Uh, there will be all those sort of stipulations in place and the ranges that are capable of showing that they do that, of capturing bullets in a certain place, of then you know, taking all the lead out of that place and refilling it back in again. And that is a lot of ranges, to be fair. Uh, then I would imagine that those are the ones that are going to get this exemption. Now, the ranges that would maybe fall foul of this, which is quite concerning. So the ranges, I believe, that would fit the criteria would be no danger area ranges. So they're completely sealed in ranges. They've normally got very high banks around them. They've got a great big bullet capture at the back. And that can be then accessed all the you know all the old lead taken out of it everything replaced the granules replaced etc and back to shooting again one of the problems would be uh, ranges with a danger area so places where you know you can still get rounds that fly over the bank at the back you know bisley has a large danger area behind it so you do get occasionally projectiles that leave the range and fly across the back there they shouldn't do because obviously everyone should be shooting into the butts but the fact of the matter is, uh, if you're out shooting at like 1,200 metres, I think that's the longest that you can shoot at Bisley. You know, there's no way that that berm at the back is big enough to catch uh, all the errant shots that go through it. And you only have to look at the backstop there. If you look at the numbers on top of the, the berm uh, on stickle down at Bisley, you'll see that a lot of those numbers have got holes through them. And that's where people have obviously shot over the backstop many times by accident. Some may even do it on purpose. Uh, but the fact is that a lot of the projectiles leave the range. There's a huge danger area at the back there where hopefully those things just drop into the danger area. No one lives in the danger area. A few deer wander around and stuff, but uh, there's no humans at the back there. It's a controlled area. And that would be the kind of area I would imagine that may fall foul of this because they cannot control the lead pollution into that area. They can't de-lead the danger area. And then there are ranges like uh, steel ranges, you know, that are set up with steel targetry on. Uh, there's a few of them around. There's a couple in Wales. There's, a, I think, one or two in Scotland. I think there's one down in uh, Cornwall somewhere. And these are ranges that often use an estate rifle exemption. They're set up for steel shooting. So you'll have all these steel plates dotted around a, a mountainside that you can shoot at. And the trouble with those is that the same thing is happening, although they're very safe because generally they're in valleys and you're shooting up at very high mountains. So there's no danger of the projectiles actually leaving that area. The problem being is that there are projectiles being sprayed all around that area and into the hillsides. And the idea that someone would be able to kind of dig all those out and de-lead them and fill them back in again, I just don't know how one would go about doing that. You know, it would be a sort of physically impossible task. So again, they might be the sort of ranges that would fall foul of this and have to use monolithic projectiles only. Monolithic projectiles, uh, I design and make them myself. That's part of my job, uh, what I do at the moment. They're very, very effective. They're excellent projectiles. They're not currently the most cost-effective things. They tend to be made on uh, CNC machines, on like Swiss lathes and they don't get made to the huge numbers as the standard uh, lead core copper jacket projectiles do, which again, you're getting the economy of scale there. Uh, you know, because the military might use uh, certain 30 cal projectiles and they buy millions of them, you're gonna benefit from the economy of scale that uh, the fact that these companies are buying in so many of those things to make for military you're going to get that benefit as well, the cost benefit, because they're obviously able to buy huge amounts of components in all the materials in a vast, uh, you know, cheapened manner. And that allows them to put them out at a good price as well. And unfortunately, monolithics just aren't like that, you know, that they are, they are quite a niche product at the moment. So the benefit in the long term would be that the monolithic projectiles will probably become far more numerous and will actually get a lot cheaper the downside is that in between times, these things are going to be very cost prohibitive to a lot of people because it's not cheap 
to shoot monolithics. And certainly in the smaller cal calibers, you would have to, you know, ask yourself, is it even worth it? You know, if you've got a 5.56 five, bolt action rifle, a 2.23 rem, and you're shooting standard FMJ through that, which is comparatively cheap, and then suddenly you've got to switch over to monolithic, then, you know, I would question whether that's even worth doing because you're probably going to find a sort of a, a 65 grain monolithic 223 projectile is going to be about as much as you're paying for an entire round at the moment. So it's certainly going to put the cost up, you know, like double what you were paying previously. Now, interestingly, they're not preventing uh, lead bullets from entering into the marketplace like they're talking about doing with shot for the shotguns. So you will still be able to buy standard lead core copper jacket projectiles. Uh, they're not being banned for live quarry currently. So that's one of the reasons that they're not limiting them on the marketplace. And they will also be allowed at these ranges that are, you know, we just discussed that may have been taking the correct precautions. And that, to be fair, is going to be most ranges. So most people are going to be able to still buy the same projectiles they're going to still be able to shoot them at their local club ranges that have all those things in place to make sure it's you know safe to clean all the lead out and, and keep a track of all that kind of thing. So it won't affect those people. It, it is only going to affect quite a, a niche number of shooters, but still, nonetheless, that's going to be an issue. So then at the end, it talks about transition periods. A transition period for the placing on the market and use of lead shot cartridges of five years is proposed. This is based on information by manufacturers on reasonable timescales required to scale up production. This, this transition period would apply to all uses of lead shot. A transition period of two years is proposed for the prohibition on lead bullets for target shooting. Whilst it is expecting, expected that most shooting ranges already have risk management measures in place. So that part there isn't actually saying the ban on bullets, you know, that they'll all be banned in two years. Like we've just discussed, there will still be bullets available on the market that have got lead in them, and you will still be able to use them at certain ranges that fall within the prescribed criteria. So what that two years is saying is that it's going to give ranges two years to bring their standards up to spec so that you can continue to use the, the lead core copper jacket stuff on those ranges and the ranges that choose not to bring them up to spec in terms of whatever the the health and safety requirements are for dealing with lead at a range then those guys after two years will not be able to shoot any lead based projectiles on that range they will have to switch to something else like the monolithics that could be a problem for some ranges that are concerned about ricochet hazard etc because i know there are some places that won't allow monolithics because of ricochet hazard and they may not be able to bring themselves up to spec to deal with this sort of lead criteria that they suddenly have to fall into in two years. So unfortunately, those would be the ranges that are going to really struggle and are probably going to end up being shut down. I don't suspect there will be many of those, but there certainly could be a handful. So the biggest one out of this for me is the lead shot ban. I think most of the guys that shoot shotgun have kind of seen it come in. There's certainly been a lot of people talking about switching over to steel you know if you go into any of the shotgun forums at the moment everyone's talking about uh, chokes and, and steel and i'll just mention a little bit about that because we do um, make some non-lead stuff at my work for the defense industry for 12 gauge so we have a little bit of a, a background in that lead is obviously preferable for 12 gauge because it's really dense is quite malleable so it doesn't tend to damage you know shotguns when it reaches the end in its wad it's not sort of blowing the ends of barrels apart and damaging the ends of people's barrels or chokes it can go through standard choke sizes right up to full choke and basically shotguns you know for years and years have all been designed around these uh, lead based cartridges hence the choke range is designed around those lead based cartridges so someone could use you know anything from a cylinder up to a full choke with most lead based cartridges and it would be absolutely fine everything would move through the shotgun with no safety concerns whatsoever now the problem comes with steel uh, it's less dense obviously the same thing with with other materials but specifically steel is a lot less dense and in terms of the cost that's probably what most people are going to switch over to because things like bismuth and itx are quite expensive 
there will no doubt be some other novel uh, materials that come out onto the market. We'll keep a close eye and see what does. That would be very interesting if there are some lead alternatives that are also cheap, that are nice and malleable, that are dense, etc. Uh, but I certainly haven't got any ideas on that one. So people will generally be switching over to steel. Steel is obviously a lot less dense, so you're going to have a lot more shot, you know, a, a lot more shot compacted into that cartridge if you were shooting say a, a 24 gram cartridge and you looked at how how much space it took up with the lead shot and then you looked at how much space it takes up with the steel shot there is a considerable difference now if you try and ram that uh, wad with all the steel shot in it through a full choke in a shotgun uh, that's going to be a problem because they can't compress they're not malleable like lead it's steel so the thing that's going to happen is the damage is going to start occurring to the choke on that shotgun or to the end of the shotgun there's going to be some pressure damage you might get bulging you might get damage to the choke and you might get splitting all kinds of things can start happening so what people are now doing is looking at getting shotguns proofed specifically proofed for steel loads to see if their shotgun will kind of survive that so what we will all have to do going forward is to take advice from manufacturers of whether it's manufacturers of the shotguns or professionals that are telling us you know the the best chokes to use for our chosen loads and from what i've heard most of it is around you know never going over half choke like a modified choke never go exceeding that with any sort of steel load uh, but I would suggest that you talk to someone in the know, probably the manufacturer of the gun that you're shooting, and just check with them what load you're going to be putting through it with steel and what chokes they recommend to use with that. There'll be people with fixed choke guns that are now in a bit of a quandary because when this comes in, which is very likely to come in, although this at the moment is just recommendations, but I can't see any reason why it won't go through, but uh, the people with fixed choke guns are going to have to do something about those guns, like get them uh, bored out slightly and reproofed, uh, probably get them multi-choked. You know, I know Teague will sort of do some work to the muzzle end of those shotguns and basically fit them up for a, a multi-choke setup. Uh, but even that isn't possible with all shotguns. So you might find that you own a shotgun that's impossible to put the multi-chokes on. It just cannot be reworked in any way whatsoever. That's going to be true of a lot of the very old guns and some of the stuff with the Damascus barrels and whatever. So unfortunately, they're going to be sort of relegated to uh, unusable with steel. I don't know if any of the other types of shot would still be usable in there. I'm not an expert in antique shotguns or anything like that. Uh, so I would again suggest that you go and talk to someone that is and find out exactly what you should be doing with that gun. If you decide to get your, you know, granddad's prized shotgun uh, reproofed and see if it will take still shot through it then you are opening yourself up for a bit of a possible issue because reproofing will involve putting three cartridges through that gun that are over pressure cartridges when we've done proof ammunition builds i think it, if i remember rightly it's 30 percent over standard cip pressure or max average pressure so it's quite considerably more than you would normally put through it and that would happen three times in the system and basically they're then going to check that gun and see if it's had any catastrophic failures if any damage has occurred and if it has they're going to send it back to you and say it didn't pass the proof and what could happen in that case is you get sent back a gun that's completely ruined you know the barrels absolutely uh, smashed to pieces at the end it didn't pass proof and they're under no sort of uh, requirement to replace that or do anything about it because you've trusted them to proof it. That's part of the procedure. If the thing doesn't pass proof, it gets damaged, you get it back. End of story. So if you really have great sentimental value to that thing and it's very old and you think there's a chance it won't pass proof, probably don't send it in to get reproofed. You know, put it in a, um, a safe, keep it there, keep it well oiled and whatever and just get it out to kind of fawn over but uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't be sending stuff like that out. If it's a more modern gun and, you know, you're going to get it uh, teagued and, and get the choke sorted on it, then, of course, by all means, send it in. Uh, but you'll have to think about the price of the gun as well, because if you've got uh, a £250 shotgun, it's probably going to cost you 
300 pound maybe to get it teagued it's going to cost you like another 50 60 quid or something like that to go and get it proofed you're also going to have to pay for the transfer there and back because that's going to have to go through an rfd so none of that's cheap you're going to pay way more to do all that than you would have done to buy the shotgun in the first place if you want to check your gun you know you can uh, have a look online there's lots of resources if you google proof marks a lot of the different countries these guns from come from have different proof marks but generally you're checking for a little fleur de lis on the uh, the proof mark if you look at your shotgun it might be stamped on the side of a barrel it could be stamped underneath on the lugs it could be in any of those places so have a look at all those it might be worth taking a picture and then like uh scanning in and zooming in with your phone because sometimes it's really difficult to see the proof marks by eye so a nice easy way is to just enlarge them with your digital camera on your phone take a picture like that and then you can enlarge them further and, and get a really clear view of what they are uh, but most of the modern shotguns i find have been uh, still proof and they will have this fleur de lis mark on there so check for that if you can't find that take it to your local gunsmith ask him to have a look at the proof marks he'll be able to tell you if it's been still proofed or not there are also different types of steel proof that it might go through so there's like a, a steel proof a superior steel proof and then there's uh even, even a, a sort of higher pressure steel proof as well so uh, you want to make sure that the cartridges you're using are right for the type of proof that you've had on that gun because if you just randomly put any old cartridge in and it hasn't been proofed for that type of cartridge that is putting more pressure through the system you might end up blowing the gun to bits if it's you that hasn't bothered checking that you will have invalidated any insurance you've got and also you could be seriously injured you could seriously injure someone else so it's just not worth the the risk there so definitely get all this stuff checked out by a gunsmith who knows what he's doing guys i hope that was of some interest like i said some good news for the air gunners some probably bad news for a lot of people in the shotgun community and some kind of middle of the road use for rifle users which a lot of which will not be affected as i said uh, definitely keep an eye on this stuff like i say it hasn't come to pass yet it's recommendations and uh, we'll just have to watch and see what happens and how the legislation ends up looking before we can make any serious judgments about what's being discussed have a great one guys take care speak to you all soon